Welcome back. In this second lecture of the week, we move on to the first of the two big name theorems that I promised you. This time, we will talk about the extremal value theorem. The material is also covered between pages 133 and 134 of your textbook. You have definitely seen this theorem already in a calculus class. What I hope you will pay attention to in this presentation is the various hypotheses that goes into the theorem. Each of the hypotheses play an important role in making the theorem tick. And while you are following the proof that is given, spare some thought in identifying how each of the hypotheses are used in the proof, and try to think about what could go wrong if the hypotheses are not met. Let's get started. We start by stating the theorem. A hypothesis states that f is a continuous function on a closed interval from a to b. Here, a and b are finite real numbers. Our conclusion is that you can find c and d in the interval, and c and d may or may not be the endpoints, but they have the property that for any x in the interval from a to b, the output of the function f of x is guaranteed to be between f of c and f of d. In other words, f of c is the global minimum of f. Global here just means in comparison with the entirety of the domain of f. So we are only thinking about the inputs that come from the interval a, b. And f of d is a global maximum of f. Now, the inequalities are not strict in the final displayed equation. This is in part obvious, since c and d are themselves values of the interval a, b, and f of c cannot be strictly greater than itself, nor can f of d be strictly less than itself. However, slightly less obviously, this non-strict inequality is in concession to the possibility that the global maximum and minimum is attained at more than one point in the domain. Before showing you the proof, I want to show you the main technical idea behind the proof. This is a very powerful tool in analysis, especially in applications to engineering and economics, where one wants to look for optimal solutions to a problem by finding minimum or maximum function outputs. This is the idea of the maximizing or minimizing sequence. I will focus the discussion on the maximizing case, and I hope you can mentally switch some inequalities around and figure out, figure out the minimizing case yourself. The idea is based on two constructions. First, if a set, of, uh, if a set S of real numbers is bounded from above, then the least, uh, by the least upper bound property, we know that S has a supremum. One way to describe the supremum is by saying that there exists an increasing sequence xn of elements of S such that the limit of the sequence is equal to the supremum. Note that the sequence is increasing, but not necessarily strictly increasing. Similarly, if a set S of real numbers is not bounded from above, then we can find within it an increasing sequence xn of elements that grows unboundedly. Both of these statements are not too hard to accept. We will prove them on the next slide. What we will do is call the sequence that we just described a maximizing sequence. Again, a maximizing sequence in an unbounded set is an increasing sequence that grows unboundedly. A maximizing sequence in a set bounded above is an increasing sequence that converges to the set supremum. The reason for studying maximizing sequences is that, in general, given a set, we do not know whether it is bounded above, or when it is, we do not know whether it contains its maximum, as opposed to having a supremum that does not belong to the set. The maximizing sequence idea sweeps all of these cases under one umbrella. A final caveat, every set with more than two elements have very, very many different maximizing sequences. There is no such thing as the maximizing sequence. Let's quickly construct maximizing sequences. In the case S is bounded above, we do so recursively. Start with x1, an arbitrary element of S. From x2 on, 
use that by definition of the supremum for every n there exists some element small s of s such that s is greater than the supremum minus 1 over n. We set x of n to be the larger of x of n minus 1 and the s we just built. Setting x of n to be larger than x of n minus 1 guarantees that the sequence is increasing. Setting x uh, larger than s guarantees that the sequence converges to the supremum. In the case s is not bounded above, instead of setting small s based on the supremum, we simply choose s at the nth step to be larger than the natural number n. Again, we set x of n to be larger than x of n minus 1 to guarantee increasing, and s to guarantee that the sequence grows unboundedly. And voila, we've made our maximizing sequences. And now we are ready to prove the extremal value theorem. The basic idea is this. We let our set S be the set of values attained by the function f. In other words, it is the image of or range of f over the closed interval a, b. In accordance to our previous slide, we choose yn to be a maximizing sequence of the set S. We next transfer the sequence from the codomain to the domain. We can do that because each element yn is in the set S, and every element of S is given by f of x for some x. The x may not be unique, in which case we can just choose one from many. The point is that it corresponding to this yn, we can find a sequence xn of points in our domain, the interval ab, such that f of xn is equal to yn. Now, xn is a sequence in a bounded interval. So by the bolzano weierstrass theorem, which appears as corollary 57 on the usable statements sheet, xn has a convergent subsequence, which we will call x sub n sub k. If you don't remember the bolzano weierstrass theorem, I encourage you to review the week four lectures at this point. The bolzano weierstrass theorem is where we use the fact that the domain is bounded or that the values a and b are finite. This convergent subsequence has a limit, which we call d. The value d must also be a point in the closed interval a, b. This is where we use the fact that the closed interval are closed sets, and closed sets are those which contain the limits of sequences. I encourage you to review the week four lectures if this concept feels a bit unfamiliar. Now, since the sequence x sub n sub k converges to d, and since d is in the domain a, b, and the function f is continuous on a, b, we know that f is continuous at d, and thus the limit of f of x sub n sub k is equal to f of d. Since f of x sub n sub k is the same as y sub n sub k, we can also write y sub n sub k converges to f of d. And therefore, f of d is the maximum of the set s. And remembering that s is the set of attainable values by the function f over the domain, this means that f of d is the global maximum of the function f. The final two steps in the proof could use a bit more explaining. In the previous slide, we argued that f of d is the global maximum because it is the limit of the sequence y sub n sub k. Now, if it were the limit of the maximizing sequence y sub n, then by design its limit would be the supremum of s if it has one. And we will be done. But no, we only know that f of d is the limit of a subsequence, so we have to do a little bit more work to justify this. Again, we split, split into two potential cases. First, if s were bounded above, then we know by definition y sub n converges to the supremum. As we learned in week 4, that if a sequence converges, then any subsequence thereof converges to the same limit. 
And therefore, in this case, we know that the limit of the subsequence y sub n sub k must also be the limit of the original sequence. And f of d is the supremum of the set S. And since f of d belongs to S, this says that f of d is the maximum. But what if S is not bounded above? Because we built the maximizing sequence to be increasing, this actually means that y sub n cannot have any accumulation points. This is because for y sub n to have an accumulation point, it must return to, uh, to nearby the accumulation point infinitely often. But as it is also growing unboundedly, this necessitates y sub n to frequently jump from a very large value back down to values near the accumulation point, which will mean that it cannot be increasing. And so our proof that y sub n sub k has a limit actually rules out the possibility that S is an unbounded set. So what's the significance of the extremal value theorem? The extremal value theorem tells us that when f is a continuous function on a closed bounded interval, it is meaningful to try to solve the optimization problems for f. This means it is meaningful to try to find values in the domain that makes f either the largest or the smallest. In engineering terms, the function f may represent the efficiency of an engine depending on a tunable parameter. In this case, you want to find the maximum, the parameter which gives the highest efficiency. In economics terms, the function f may represent the cost of manufacturing depending on the units produced. And in this case, you will want to find the minimum, the number to produce, that will minimize the cost. The extremal value theorem tells you that if the function f is continuous and your domain is closed and bounded, then trying to solve this problem is not a, a false errand. Okay, that's it for this lecture. See you next time.